Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. Today I'm here with Sam Stevens, who is also a founder and CEO. Her company is called Catalyst AI. Uh, before that, Sam worked as a product leader at companies such as American Express, Tinder, and Google. Welcome to the show, Sam. Thanks, Carlos. So great to be here. Great to have you one more time with us. Uh, Sam and I go way back. Uh, you've been a tremendous contributor to our community in different ways. Fun fact, you were the first ever instructor at Product School when we had a physical campus in Los Angeles. Uh, you've been a speaker at our conferences. Uh, you're also the creator of our artificial intelligence for product certification. So it's funny for me to now have this type of conversation with you in public after so many private conversations. I love that. And it's been great uh, to be along on the, the Product School journey from, from the early days and I'm excited to bring you along on, on my journey now that I'm in the early days of uh, my own startup. Exactly. Uh, when, you st when you started contributing, I think you were a director of product at Tinder. Mm -hmm. uh, and now you are the CEO of your own company, Catalyst AI. So maybe we can start there. Can you tell us a little bit more about your current company? Absolutely. Uh, so Catalyst AI is an AI project manager that helps product teams automate all of that manual coordination work that takes so much time. So the way that it works is it integrates with the apps that your team already uses and actually uses AI to understand all of the work and conversations that are going on, whether that's in your Slack conversations, in your meetings, in your JIRA tickets, to use that information in order to automate project management tasks and create a single source of truth for the project. So it's really easy to find all that information, like what's the status of this project? What did we decide to do about that experiment three months ago? Things like that. So what could be a, a good example for a, a product manager? Of how to use it? Uh-huh. Yeah. So one of my favorite features that um, we've been building is, well, so a little bit of a um, background story. So when I was a product lead at Google, one of my responsibilities was to write our weekly status report. And it would go out to all of the executives and it would provide a lot of visibility to the work that my team was doing. And everyone loved reading it. Like I would make it colorful. I would add jokes. It was so great. And it was the bane of my existence. I hated writing this status report. It would take me two hours every Wednesday morning. I would like dread going to work because I would spend so much time searching across my workspace for information, right? Like DMing the engineers, asking, did you finish this task? Because nobody updates their task, reading back through all my emails, figuring out what decisions were made, looking at my calendar, remembering like what we talked about in meetings. And I was so frustrated. I remember having this like very visceral feeling of like, why isn't this automated? right? All of this information lives on our computers. Like it's all accessible. We're all in this knowledge workspace. Why isn't there, I wish there was something that would just like do this work for me and automate it for me. So one of my favorite features that we're building is exactly that, which is automatically generating status reports, looking back across all of the information across your connected apps, right? Those, those meeting notes, those Slack conversations, those task tickets to uh, automatically create the report, um, of everything that happened in the past week or two weeks to just, you know, click a button, generate it, make some light edits and send that out in like 10 minutes. So you've been feeling the pain for a long time. And I guess that's part of the inspiration behind building the solution. Exactly. Exactly. You know, the, the phrase, uh, you know, for authors, write what you know, I think it applies to startup founders to build what you know. Um, you know, and so being able to, uh, empathize with my own, users and solve my own pain points that I've experienced that I've talked to, you know, hundreds of other PMs who have also experienced it has been uh, very, very fulfilling for me and also very fun. So it's a big leap to go from building at a company versus building now your own company. Um, so I'm curious to know what are some of those things that you notice that help you and your transition from product leader to CEO? Yeah, I think, you know, one of one of the big realizations is um, 
when you see that there's a problem in the world or in an industry and you really, really care about it and you kind of look around at the company that you're at and, and at other companies and realize no one's solving this and there's kind of this feeling of like, why don't I take matters into my own hands, right? Like, why don't I go solve this? Because who else is going to, if not me? And so I think that's one of those feelings that you need in order to make that jump. I think you, you know, need to feel a lot of that, like, um, ownership and passion and gut instinct around, like, this is a problem and I'm the right person to, to go and solve that. One of the downsides that I can imagine, especially coming from Google or Tinder, right? They're big, super successful organizations where there's a lot of other people helping. Now, there's no uh, business analyst or user researcher or other functions. It's you are wearing all the hats. So I yes. can imagine like the product manager hat is familiar to you, but like how were you, how did you go about, you know, figuring out other things that were a little bit more outside your comfort zone? Yeah, I think the there's truly nothing that can prepare you for being a founder. You end up doing things and forcing yourself to to learn things and figure things out that you never thought you'd be able to do. Some of it, you know, it's like, oh, I need to go figure out um, marketing. And some of it is like, I need to go figure out payroll taxes <laughs> and to pay employees around the world, right? Like uh, various sorts of business owner things um, a lot. I mean, com luckily, we have lots of resources, you know, online, lots of books available. I'm uh, lucky to have lots of wonderful mentors who have helped me along my journey that I can rely on. And people have been very kind with their with their time and their feedback. Um, and I, I think becoming a founder has actually really changed my and evolved my point of view on what makes a good product manager, right? As somebody who People claim, you know, there's the expression, oh, the PM is the CEO of the, the product, the mini CEO. And before being a founder, I was like, oh, yeah, like, that's so great. Like, I get to make all these decisions and priorities and trade-offs and work with the engineers. And now that I'm an actual CEO, and I'm sure you can relate to this too, like, there is so much more to the product role that I think a lot of PMs in big companies don't really get exposure to, right? Like, a lot of PMs, um, I think, is, you know, I think this changes kind of as you become more more senior perhaps. I think a lot of PMs starting off don't quite realize the impact that um, thinking about things like uh, the product marketing or sales or customer support, um, they kind of rely on each of those other specialized roles to do those things. But really like that should be such a core focus of the PM, not just the product itself, but all of those other pieces that go into making a successful business and ultimately product. I, I agree. I think that when I became a CEO, I changed my approach on how to think about product. And uh, when it's, we hire product managers, I specifically want them to feel real ownership, regardless of if it's leading by authority or leading by um, influence. The point is, I need to ensure that someone is here, not just representing the user, but representing the business and creating solutions that can drive business outcomes. That was something that didn't, wasn't that obvious to me when I was just working as a product manager. And, and I, I hope this, this mindset is now being applied to people that they don't have to become CEOs in order to realize that PMs need to make, you know, be more, more, more involved in ultimately how to contribute to revenue for an organization. Yeah, for sure. Although I, I will say it's it's one thing to to you know study it or, or read about it and hear about it. It's another thing to be forced into actually living it. And there's no no better education than a lived experience. So I would <laughs> always always hire a, a former founder as a PM would be my advice to anyone hiring. That's a that's a good one. Um, I mean, the other thing that I I, I see in your product that that's very uh, interesting to me is AI. Because of course now there's a lot of new AI companies or companies that are just using the word AI, but you've been using AI for a long time. So when was the first time that you actually got exposed to, to AI for specific use cases? Yeah, let's see. My first exposure, when I first learned what um, AI was, or really machine learning was at American Express. 
Um, we had, I was working on the, uh, the, the team that managed the, the, the website, right, amex.com. Um, and we had a machine learning team that was running our personalization engine that they were building. And this was back in 2014-ish, let's say. So way, way before any of like, you know, these modern uh, generative AI models came out. Um, but the model that they were using was understand or building this uh, basically a recommendation algorithm to look at, um, do uh, cohort analyses of transactions and uh, create kind of profiles of certain types of users to then be able to predict what kinds of transactions in the future similar users uh, might make in order to target them with um, uh, specialized offers for like various lending products that uh, that the company had. And so that was kind of my first foray into uh, into the field. Um, Tinder used a lot, lots of, um, you know, machine learning and, and AI in our recommendation algorithm. I remember one of the things that um, I, I loved working on was a feature called smart photos, um, which basically like when you, when a user uploads, I don't know, I don't know if they, if they still have this feature now or how it's evolved, but when I was there, when a user would um, upload their photos, uh, we would use AI to predict which of the most, which of their photos would be the most successful and automatically um, order the photos in their profile so that the best one or the one that had the highest likelihood to be liked would be shown first. So as people were swiping through, we were like optimizing each user's uh, profile for them. Um, so now that it's time for you to actually implement AI in a, in a way that it's solving problems, you mentioned a use case for your own product, like uh, note, note taking or helping, in this case, PMs find information that is somewhere in their workspace faster. Uh, how did you go about actually building this type of capability? Um, because it's relatively unique, like a lot of people talk about it, but like you are someone who's built that thing that is that is real, that, that people can start seeing value right away. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, for, first and foremost, I have a, a group of incredible engineers um, who are, have deep backgrounds in the uh, machine learning space. So that always helps a, a PM, you know, accelerate them. Um, but really from the product perspective, thinking about, you know, in this new world where, where knowledge workers, you know, PMs, particularly in my case, are interacting with AI and this new type of technology, like what are the what are the principles that we're applying? What are we optimizing for? And so some of those um, initial principles that we um, <clears throat> we went about leveraging were some of, some of the things we talk about in a, in AIPC. But there's a new a new way that uh, I think humans are are interacting with machines and machine intelligence. Right? There's a there's like a, this trust but verify type of paradigm where there's so much power. You know, or like it, it assumed power in these uh, these new regenerative models that can make decisions and and not make analyses and do all these things. But at the end of the day, like the human still needs to be a partner, at least right now, um, in order to verify and understand like why a certain decision was made. Um, and so, going about you know building the product not from the engineering perspective, but more from the product perspective bringing in these new principles of how humans and machines can interact um, and like collaborate together uh, was a big kind of guiding light in uh, in the direction of the product. So one of the, the things that come to mind is, okay, I also have my Slack inbox that is out of control, my Jira out of control, email, same thing. So there's almost we're at a point where I just have access to way too much information yeah. and but what I need is to get to insights faster so I can make the best possible decision. Uh, so how are you able to ensure that with that power that now you have, you're able to provide those insights uh, to ensure that, you know, whoever is going to work with those insights can make the best possible decision. Yeah. So what what we're doing at <clears throat> at Catalyst is um, tying together all of those disparate pieces of information, right? Your Slack messages, your Jira tickets, soon to be your emails. Understanding 
Um, basically connecting the dots that right now you have to do as a person and you don't have time to do, but understanding semantically how each of those different pieces tie together and impact one another. And then ultimately, what does that mean for you, right? How do we then create those, um, or rather we are, we are building our own models to be able to recommend uh, what decision should you make and why in order to maximize your outcomes. So it's that, it is that like, we have this information overload, right? Our information is spread out across all these different apps. You're constantly checking your Slack, your email, your Jira tasks, your notifications, everything. And there's just sort of like sheer chaos. We have all these like productivity and organization tools, but they're, they're like more work. They just create more work and more things to check. And so um, the premise behind Catalyst is bringing that information all together, right? Instead of you going and searching for it, um, it instead it gathers it um, for you in order to just help uh, alleviate that cognitive load and that time spent searching to do exactly that, guide those decisions, give you the information that you need, you, let you ask specifically for you know the questions you have of your workspace and retrieve that information for you and then automate those manual tasks around like coordination and figuring out you know who needs to do what and did you create a task for this and did you post the notes to the slack channel right we are automating all of that for teams yeah, yeah that's that's one of my skepticisms with productivity tools right they have all good intentions and they when used right they they can save you time but there are just so many productivity tools <laughs> that at some point end up becoming one more distraction. Uh, I saw that with email, I'm seeing that with chats, and uh, I saw that with project management tools like Jira. So the idea of consolidating information, wherever it is, and highlighting or surfacing what is really what I need to look at sounds really appealing. Uh, but I have a strategy question around that because I'm seeing now how Slack, or other tools are now doing their own AI feature, right? So it's like AI just launched, and they are providing this type of summaries for like the different mm -hmm. channels. Um, Zoom and Google Meet also have their own features to transcribe the notes that were discussed during a meeting. So how do you see the opportunity of integrating with those, those tools, also considering that they can also pose a, a, a threat as a bigger platform that has more distribution. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, all these tools are certainly gonna integrate, you know, or build their own AI functionality. What we're doing is we're the glue that ties all of these disparate apps together. We're this intelligence layer that sits on top of your Zoom notes, of your Slack AI summaries, of your ClickUp tasks, of your Google Docs, right? Um, to understand how do these disparate da data sources relate to one another and impact one another. And then a step beyond that, what does that mean for you as Carlos, for your work versus me as Sam for my work um, and personalize uh, you know, recommendations and operations for each team? And so as you know, the fact that Zoom is creating um, or that like Slack launched their you know, AI summarization, that's great. That actually saves work on my part because now I don't have to first summarize Slack conversations. I can like leverage the summaries that already get created. Um, but still, like we are that missing link that is taking that summary and figuring out, great, what impact does that have on this JIRA task? What impact does that have on this project overall? And how does that email that we got also relate back to it and tying all those data bits together? Got it. Sounds like a summary of summaries with the context around what's happening across the different stack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very uh, similar. Remember automating a lot of those those manual tasks, right? Like sending out, we take meeting notes, we post those to Slack. We DM you your your action items. We send out your uh, status reports. So like we have a, a like AI project manager mode where all of those manual things that oftentimes as PMs we're tasked with like keeping stakeholders up to date. Keep you know we we sometimes frame it as product execution, but a lot of the time it's really like hurting cats um, and just making sure that everyone is like doing their job and like things are accounted for. And you're like, hey, did you remember to follow up on that? Or hey, did you, you know, um, do this task? Or what's the status of this? Can you update your tickets? All of that manual stuff that takes so much time and like really isn't the core um, value of having a product manager on the team is all stuff that we're automating. So how are you thinking about the, the target 
user given that, of course, this has a lot of potential for so many different people, but at the same time, you want to start with a group of early adopters that are going to champion that initiative and hopefully help you roll it out across the org. Yeah, so we're, we're starting with PMs, right? Starting with uh, with the, the folks that are in our community that we know and love, that we know have this pain point. Um, I don't think I've talked to a single PM who hasn't been like, wow, yeah, I spend so much of my time uh, you know, ask DMing, asking engineers to update their status tickets or asking about this or searching through emails or going to status meetings or X, Y, and Z, right? Um, so very proven, uh, you know, market need and use cases, starting with PMs, um, integrating this into like product development teams to, uh, you know, alleviate a lot of that workload. Um, studies show actually that knowledge workers, right, folks who are doing most of the, the, the tasks that we're doing on their computers, et cetera, spend 60% of their time on coordination type of tasks. This is actually a study by Asana. They refer to it as work about work, right? Which is like status meetings and searching for information hidden in your emails, right? Just doing work to figure out what is the work that I need to do, right? Um, so being able to, our, our value proposition is allowing folks to, uh, allowing teams to reclaim that time, starting with, uh, you know, product development teams. So as you think about the future for, for the product team, what are other use cases or situations where you see that AI is going to change the way they work today? Oh, I think so many parts of it, Carlos. I think every every step of the product development process is going to be impacted some way by AI. From starting with um, you know customer discovery and user interviews, there's really interesting tools that um, are either you know able to uh, conduct user interview studies at a fraction of the cost. Like user user research is fantastic, but it's very expensive to run studies and recruit and do all of those things. So there's you know information there. There's the ability to um, summarize user feedback, whether that's through you know surveys or um, customer support tickets, right? And like detect the insights there. So applying AI to gathering information at the you know in the discovery process um, to the the you know planning, whether that's like writing your PRD or helping you come up with a strategy. Um, being kind of that thought partner, being able to look across um, different parts of your, your organization and, and the past history of what's been successful, what hasn't been successful, detecting if there's like other teams doing the same type of projects, right? That's something that at larger companies, like when I was at Google, um, happened a lot. You would, you would go down the path of doing one project uh, only to realize like a few months in that, oh, there's this other team over, over here uh, that's doing the exact same thing. So being able to surface that type of information um, in the execution phase, you know, apps like Catalyst that are um, helping accelerate teams, automating mundane work, allowing PMs to focus more on the right strategy, on talking to customers, on digging deep with a uh, with with design and and those types of things, um, and then measurement, right? Like there's a lot of really interesting data analysis uh, functionality that. Um, AI is able to write SQL code and generate dashboards for you. Like having an AI data analyst, which sounds like the coolest thing ever as, as a PM. So I think it's going to change every part of the process. I mean, one thing that I, I noticed uh, back in the day, this maybe like 10 years ago when, when I started product school, there's still a lot of companies hiring product managers that had a technical background. Like having a technical background was a big deal, meaning if you knew how to code, if you really knew how to build a thing, uh, that was an edge. Uh, that would give you an edge. Uh, I saw how the evolution of a lot of technology, like no code or low code tools, allowed PMs, regardless of their background, to be able to run data analysis, to create prototypes, to do things that before just required just a different type of background. <clears throat> and that shifted the pendulum a little bit more to for companies to look for PMs that were more business oriented, that were thinking about go to market and how to actually monetize a product. Uh, we're now in another situation where like AI still seems relatively scary to some, right? Like 
when when you talk about integrating AI into a product, like how technical do PMs really need to be in order to be able to to take advantage of this opportunity? I think, um, look, being being technical will never hurt you as a PM. However, the beauty of um, at least language models is that they speak English, right? Like this is this is one of the reasons why this age of language models is so interesting and so novel because before you had to speak code to these models, right? Now you can speak in English and get it to do the things that you need it to do. That's revolutionary, right? Like that's absolutely resolu- revolutionary. These models are like the Rosetta Stone of technology. They speak all these different languages. They speak English and text and code and music and images, right? And you can translate and, and manipulate all of them with just commands and, and prompts. And that's absolutely incredible. And I think that uh, now more than ever, it's easier for non-technical folks, not just PMs, but really anyone, right? Like a, a musician, a content creator, a author to be able to leverage the power of AI um, for their own workflows in a way that was never possible before. And um, this reminds me of some of the conversations that you and I had in private um, when helped us create that artificial intelligence for product certification. Because we were really trying to demystify AI as a, as a technology that anyone, in this case, product team can use regardless of their background. And um, so maybe it would be good to spend some time just talking about like, US, the, the UX interface. Like we are very much used to just using chat interface when when interacting with some of these these models so curious in, in your experience like what are some of the, the ux um experiences that are good for for ai you know in ai where other pms can make the most out of the tool without having to go to the to the code base and and just try to you know tweak the, the LLM. yeah i think we're really just starting to scratch the surface of what's new or what's possible in this new world where models can write code on the fly and like build UI elements on the fly. And so when we think about the future of user experiences, there's there's definitely a world where there's no such thing as like static software. There's definitely a world where like you and I can log into the same, even like B2B SaaS tool and easily have our own customized experiences based off of our roles, who we are, what we're looking for, what we're doing at the moment, and have very, very dynamic user experiences as like HTML is being written on the fly um, in order to adapt to what we're doing. It might be something that's more, um, I think user experiences might evolve to be something that's more like task oriented, where maybe the whole screen changes and adapts to, even if you're writing a document, you might have a different experience writing a PRD versus like an experiment analysis document, right? You might want different information surfaced to you at the right time. Um, or it might just be a personalized thing, right? Like you might want your, your default colors to be in dark mode. Well, I might prefer, um, you know, a, a purple background and being able to like customize and personalize the experience for ourselves. And so I think that there's so much really interesting uh opportunity and things that can be done beyond beyond the chatbot, right? Beyond just the the conversational interface um, that that we've really yet to scratch the surface of. And, and that's that's why I keep thinking about AI as a as a key as a key opportunity or as a key skill for any PM uh, versus just thinking of it as oh you have to be a, a specialized AI PM. I mean I can imagine there's going to be like very technical PMs that interact with large language models and they need to have specific skill set for that. But in general, like what's your take on this uh, AI PM versus PM that happens to know about AI? Sure. And we, I think this is one of the first things we say in AI PC is every PM is going to be an AI PM because this technology is really a platform shift, right? It's going to be um, pervasive. It's going to be everywhere. It's, it's already been everywhere, right? Like, AI, machine learning, these are not new things. Um, but because of the, you know, this this influx and this this change in time where it's more accessible because it speaks English, um, it's becoming more and more uh 
prevalent in, in our technologies and in our apps and it's becoming more powerful. I think there will be, so I think there, to your point, there will be PMs who are building the models themselves and building like the infrastructure and the underlying technology, similar to right now, like we have, um, you know, PMs who are the PMs of an algorithm, right? We'll, we'll continue to see that. Um, but I think more and more we'll also continue to see PMs leveraging this technology more deeply into their products as features. I agree. And in the same way, I, st I don't see AI as a function. Like I just don't see, I mean, I know some companies are just creating those titles. That sounds cool, like chief AI officer, VP of AI. But to me, it sounds more like an underlying technology that it's supporting a function, in this case, product, as it could support other functions versus a dedicated function. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, Sam, and uh, what's next for Catalyst AI as we wrap up this, this interview? Yeah, so we are getting ready for launch. We're uh, wrapping up our closed beta right now. So we'll be launching uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I'm really excited to start uh, getting feedback from uh, members of the, the product school community. If anyone would like to, to use it and become an early adopter, reach out to me on LinkedIn, would love to have you. Um, and excited to, to bring this into the world and, and start you know freeing up hours of work, hours of frustrating and annoying work uh, for, for PMs that we've all experienced. Uh, thank you for your time and, and for the offer, Sam. Uh, always a pleasure to pick your brain on all things AI. You've been such a good mentor and, and friend along this journey. Um, and I can't wait to see what you can uh, continue building for, for, for the entire product community. Thanks, Carlos. Always a pleasure, likewise. And thanks for having me.